are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Fire University. Uh, Today, we're talking to David Holly with wild turkey report and uh we're going to talk about wild turkeys and the use of fire and this is going to be part of our wild turkey week so i hope you enjoy uh david thank you so much for taking the time to come on here i see you on social media all the time and of course we know each other from uh, growing up in the same town and uh I've, I've really appreciated a lot of the the uh the passion that you've had for cons- conservation of wild turkeys. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate that. And thanks for coming on the show. Well, likewise, Marcus, you know, I've got a huge passion for the wild turkey and, um, you know, so many of my memories and friendships and, you know, I, I owe so much to the wild turkey and it's the last several years. It's really been cool to see this upswell of support for, you know, habitat work and a lot of the things that are going into help and solve some of the issues that the wild turkey faces. I'm sure most of your listener base by now knows that the wild turkey does have some challenges, especially here in the deep South. And mm-hmm. so it's going to take a collaborative effort really from state agencies, conservation organizations on down to the, to the average landowner and average hunter uh, to fix mm-hmm. this, but we've all got a role to do. And um, one thing we've tried to do with the wild turkey report is not just highlight the hunting of the wild turkey, but also the conservation. And sure. probably have done more of that the last few years than actually spotlighting the hunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the hunting is, is driving a lot of people to be interested and want to conserve the species and is certainly a, a really important part of it. And uh, I think you've done a, a really awesome job of, of highlighting the fun of it, the, the uh, camaraderie of it, you know, the like you said, you have so many fond memories within your family and friends, and and uh, that's an important aspect of it and really drives a lot of landowners, which uh, private landowners are the primary landowners in the South that, that own a majority of the land the turkeys are on, drives them to be interested in conserving the turkey. So, uh, yeah, this is a really important thing to think about when we're talking about uh, conserving that species. So, uh, one thing I, I wanted to kind of kick off with is I, I know that you've posted quite a bit and I've seen places where you've been using prescribed fire on your own family's property. And you're, I, as far as I can tell, uh, completely managing that property specifically to produce a lot of turkeys. Is that accurate? Well, so just give a little background. So our family farm has been in the family since the 1940s and my great great grandfather or not great 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 grandfather so it would have been my I messed that up my <laughs> great grandfather's dad all right so yeah. he's my great grandfather uh our family's been in the cattle business and so he bought this farm in 1940 and cleared a lot of the land especially except for some of the bottom land you mm-hmm. know area. so a lot of what we've done has been converting you know the 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 uh, slowly but surely away from the cattle operation. We're still, you know, run about a hundred mama cows on our place, but mm-hmm. a lot of our place we've converted and used CRP and WRP and other things sure. to produce habitat. And so we really kind of came through, you know, prescribed fire. We always knew it was very beneficial and, you know, had friends that were in the timber industry that burn. And of course, dad grew up in an era, which a lot of people, you know, burn mm-hmm. and, setting the woods on fire. So we, we knew about prescribed fire and the benefits. So 
probably the early 2010s was when kind of our stuff um, started coming of age. It was either, you know, right at that, that kind of thinning age, you know, 12, 13 years old, mm-hmm. it just gone through it. And so we started getting on a prescribed burn regime back then. And the mindset back then was kind of, well, we need to get everything clean and ready for turkey season. We want to yeah. burn this land, get it ready. Uh, have turkeys that come in there, you know, the next day, that magnet effect is mm-hmm. all the time. What we kind of learned through the years was that doing that wall to wall burning was not really the best thing for our property. And so we started, you know, checkerboarding it more. There's places that are, you know, on a two year interval, there's places on a three year interval, you know, every stand's a little bit different, but we try to burn around, around 300 acres a year is our target, but mm-hmm. you know, as it happens, you know, you end up falling short. So we kind of have to establish some of our priority areas. And then, you know, there's areas that are not getting burned that, you know, we're trying to figure out some other way, whether that's, you know, bush hog and fifth rows or something to to improve accessibility. But Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, I'm a pyro. I envy what you and some others do of getting to burn so much. And you certainly uh, shed a lot of light on some of the, the ways that fire could be used outside of the dormant season, which mm-hmm. is what so many people normally think of uh, burning February, March. And that's always going to be the, the peak, but I've gotten really intrigued in the fall burning. Now this year was kind of an outlier because the conditions were so poor. I had a good burn on September of 11th, did a great job in knocking back that, you know, woody stem infestation. Mm-hmm. You know, but I had several burns after that because of the ground moisture, you know, were just complete flops. And so yeah. I'm learning a little bit about that. But, you know, really, I think it's important to have balance as a manager and how you use fire of not just thinking dormant season um, and not just thinking wall to wall burning. Mm-hmm. You know, there's opportunities in hardwoods, as you talk about all the time. So it's just it's a very versatile tool that really. As I've told you before, Marcus, I think that landowners um, have to become as versed in this as they are hooking up a bush hog and going and getting on a tractor and bush hogging mm-hmm. all day. I know there's public safety implications that come into that, but as you know, someone that's properly trained that takes the proper precautions and burns on the right day, uh, the risk level is 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 fairly low, mm-hmm. and so that's where. I'm so encouraged by what you're doing. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric coming through social media now. Um, you know, the social media has its its downside. Mm-hmm. But done a great job of educating people. And I've had so many people, as I'm sure you have too, that have seen what you're doing, and seeing what Dr. Chamberlain's doing, and seeing what we've been promoting on Prescribe Fire that said, hey, we got our CBM and, and we're starting to burn now. And, yeah. You know, we're doing some of this strip disc. And so, Social media, I ought to say, is just is a wonderful tool for getting more fire and, and more management on the landscape. And, um, you know, it's just it's important for us to keep beating that drum and keep educating people where they're not afraid of it and start to utilize it the way it should mm-hmm. be. So uh, there are a couple of things that you said that make me want to follow up with some questions. W- one. So. I, I don't want you to tell me your age but uh you said in 2010 is that when you started using fire around that time yeah so that was the first year that we we used fire in our um under our plantations Uh, okay so you know now i've i've been on probably you know pushing 100 burns now which i know some of your cohorts is 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 nothing they they do that probably (laughs) Well, the reason (laughs) reason I was asking you is, you know, you were already very knowledgeable uh, about managing for wildlife and turkeys uh, before that. And I I was just curious what, not what stimulated you to do it, but what helped you get past that Mm -hmm. initial barrier? Like you, you know, what? we commonly deal with this, especially with people who they're, they're kind of interested in using fire, but there's a barrier right. to developing that skill and starting to use it. What, how did, how did that play out with you guys? Well, 
my dad had been pretty versed in, in, in Burns and, you know, assisted some of his clients on Burns mm-hmm. and things like that. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's a real estate broker by trade. So some of the, you know, clients he had, he'd go and assist their forester and stuff. So, and we had, you know, through the years, he had done some prescribed mm-hmm. burns um, here. But, um, you know, we were good friends with a number of foresters, like I said. So I don't think we were necessarily like scared. And it, it was more of just getting the plantations to the age in which they could be burned. I mean, it was always a mm-hmm. goal of ours uh, there. And we started slow. I mean, we started small. We didn't try to, you know, light, you know, ring fires and set 50 acres at a time. I mean, we'd burn little tens and fifteens mm-hmm. and things like that that we could manage. Um, that would be my biggest advice to people. Look, it, it's more time consuming and yeah, you're not going to get the amount of acres done, but, um, it's just starting mm-hmm. slow and small. Standing how to, you know, look at a NOAA forecast and see what the conditions are and say, yes, this is the day I do it. And then when you get boots on the ground saying, okay, it's responding. I mean, fire is, is just something that, um, it's not to it's not to be scared of, but it's not to take lightly. And a lot of that just really comes down with the conditions you're burning on. Mm-hmm. So learning, you know, what the forecast is telling you and verifying that in the fire that you have is really important. Uh, I, I learned something from every single burn. Uh, yeah. Something the way the fire behaved, you know, when it was the humidity was this or winds were this or I, I did this fire ignition pattern. So it's just um. It's something really someone needs to do these, whether it's CBM, you know, CBMs, a lot of states, um, I believe are pre- predominantly classroom driven. There needs mm-hmm. to be a on the ground, you know, shadowing the forester, shadowing the forestry commission. Mm-hmm. Um, textbooks have been great, but, you know, there's science and then there's applied science and getting out there yep. on the ground and, and knowing a lot of those lessons that you've learned over those, those four or five days in that course. Yeah. Well, and I, I know uh, you shared recently and I've, I've shared a number of opportunities as well. There's a lot of learn and burn yes. opportunities out there with multiple organizations and <coughs> excuse me. And uh, I'm seeing a pop up in a lot of states, lots of organizations. And I, I kind of like you, uh, uh, I'm, my what I'm seeing on social media is probably biased by what I put on it, but I, I do uh, find some encouragement in seeing, you know, this this interest seeming to peak in the use of prescribed fire in the South, in particular, uh, to manage habitat for wildlife, but specifically turkeys, which uh, I think most people would agree is is something that's really needed at a landscape scale for that Absolutely. species. Absolutely, the learning burns uh, are really promising to me. Um, I really feel that every, you know, forestry unit district unit, county unit in the state of Alabama should should be required to host a learning burn. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty pretty tall ask, but I mean, it, that's that's something that can educate people. And not so much on just how I can use it, but okay, how's this going to benefit my land so that, and, and connecting the dots on the resources. As you know, mm-hmm. private consulting foresters, there's, you know, in the state of Alabama, the, the Forestry Commission here will do, you know, burn for hire, um, understanding the funding, you know, through EQIP and NRCS programs. Um, so yeah, a lot of those subsidy programs, these, these landowners just don't understand how to connect the dots and that a, a place like a learn and burn, they can see a fire in progress and know that, Hey, this is not going to burn my forest down. If pe- people that are properly mm-hmm. trained, you know, following the prescription and follow my wishes, not to crown scorch the whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's very safe and here's the benefits. Now let me figure out how to connect the dots and you know fund this and and, and make it happen. So um, yeah, that that's kind of the as I view the, there's one big hurdle um, to getting more well on the private landowner. You know I'm saying the 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 person that's trying that's on the property actively managing. We we have this whole other group you know. <laughs> you know, to go down a rabbit hole that's that's not utilizing fire and they're they're resistant to it is completely different uh in a lot of ways than the average landowner. Um, you know, it's 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 a liability and a cost issue. And so we've got to as a as a community um figure out how to make 
fire more lucrative and uh, or, or financially feasible for the TMOs, the Timberland companies, um, even mm-hmm. your individuals that, you know, own 50, 60, 70,000 acres. Uh, when you're in places like where you and I grew up, you're talking about a very large percentage of our land base, especially in certain parts of our county that's controlled by those types of landowners. And statistically speaking, they have a pretty high resistance. Mm-hmm. Uh, lack of desire to implement prescribed burning and thus, you know, the wildlife's not benefiting. Um, so yeah. that to me, the t- two efforts that we can move the needle on are, are when I, when I say small, I'm not saying forties, but you know, the small private landowner and yeah. then try to figure out ways to make the, the, um, the, the, the numbers work, the, the, li- the liability work for, the the TMOs, the timber companies, people like that. Mm-hmm. The ones that that really are their their finances and risk are, you know, driving man, management decision rather than uh, some, well, some of the Marcus, others. I think a lot of it's just what what do we really want to accomplish in our ask to them. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. going to ask, ask Santa Claus for a billion dollars. You know, and he's going <laughs> to give you a hundred dollar bill. Well, hundred dollar bill was better than not asking. Yeah, you, you know, and it's like. There are certain places on these types of properties that are going to be, um, I don't know if you want to call them like HBU's areas, but like uh, the, the area 60 yards off of a main road, the areas that, you know, are, are a peninsula of two SMZs that are going to have a pretty high value for wild turkeys in particular. Mm-hmm. Let, let's not ask for the moon. Right. For you know, just a little bit and saying, Hey, I'm not asking you to burn all 200 acres that you thin this year, mm-hmm. you know, about this 50 yard strip. And if, if I'm a lessee that wants fire and I'm jumping from the rooftops, well, hey, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is and help, help the company put in fire breaks. That'll be my contribution to mm-hmm. it. So, all that to say is, I think it's just really about curbing our expectations. I mean, we cannot expect any landowner um, to, to burn, you know, 70, 80 percent of their property uh, metric. Um, that's great when we have people that have that much of their property that's treated with fire. But um, getting to, you know, 10 or 15 percent across the landscape on, you know, that sector of land would be a massive win for the wild turkey and all wildlife. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's a good point. Not necessarily all of the acreage, but getting just a a few percentage points could make a huge difference at the landscape level. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. Well, related to this on, on your place, since what you you've been using fire for a little better than a decade now, uh, and I know that you are uh, in touch with what's going on with the turkeys on your place. Have you seen any benefits? Like, have you perceived? changes in the the turkeys uh from that effort that you would attribute to the the burning i i feel so um and, and this is why i've been you know selfishly pushing for for more people to get involved in prescribed fire because turkeys are such a a fickle thing in the fact that they have such a large home range mm-hmm. that me burning that 40 acres is not going to solve all the problems of the thousand or two thousand or three thousand acres mm-hmm. around there. I look for inc- incremental, you know, positive uh trends and I, I do see that. Um but really, you know, the the greater area around me, like my greatest role is not just to burn here, it's to try to advocate for neighbor John a mile and a half to start his place with fire because ultimately that's gonna mean that the neighborhood as as so to speak is stronger sure. has Nesting habitat has better, better brewing habitat and thus the entire population because the jakes that he raises, uh, that he's seeing on his place a mile and a half now or two miles away, they may be the goblin turkeys on my place next year. Mm-hmm. So that's really the whole thing I'm trying to get through with this conglomerate mindset or cooperative mindset is just everyone's on board with it. The results we can achieve are pretty substantial. I don't, I don't think that should ever dissuade someone that has. 40 or 100 or 200 acres to burn for not doing it. Mm-hmm. 
going to see positives from it um, in, in so many ways, but I'm realistic in knowing that I'm not going to solve all the problems in my general area myself. Yeah. No, I think that's a, if I, a say, yeah. A good if point. I can just save two nests, but my efforts save two or three nests and that ends up being, you know, uh, let's just throw out a realistic number, you know, five, five in each clutch that end up being adults. That's 15 more turkeys that, that, you know, that I've helped to raise. And that was well worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you've said a couple of things that are important. One, most landowners don't own, at least uh, the non-industrial private landowners don't own enough land where they're going to completely solve the population issues in their area by themselves. That's not necessarily what you're trying to do. We know that uh, most landowners don't have that opportunity, but if you get together, you might be able to do that for your local population. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, I, I hear this a lot. People, uh, that definitely seems to deter uh, managing, you know, where it's like, well, I'm not going to make a, I'm not going to solve the issue, so I may as well not do anything. And you can still have some real, benefits even if you have 40 you're a piece of the pie you need you know help get even if you're just showing your neighbors that it can be done and then they start doing it as a result then that would be a big win right there but uh you also gain some other things like if you're the only place burning uh, you know where the turkey is going to be during turkey season you know that's another way to look at it you might gain some other benefits that that uh you enjoy from doing that so if we could get into that kind of mindset well, and then everybody starts doing that then we might be able to make some real big population gains right and i think you know just looking back and granted our numbers have just for the last seven years have been just in, in such flux but even back before then when we had a really strong population you know on just our place the when I saw the biggest magnet effect was when a thinning was combined yeah. with fire a year later. Um, just the understory response was, I think, a little bit more beneficial. You know, we're, we're you know, and I know there's a lot of people on here that have probably seen some of our photos and say, "Man, you need to you need to open up that <laughs> canopy." And you're exactly right. Uh, it's tough to move wood yeah, right now. No, I'm with you. <laughs> but uh, it's getting it's getting a little better. But um, you know. When we have our next thinning, um, hopefully this summer, and and follow that up a year later with a burn, that to me is when I'm going to really mm-hmm. know what what all because I think that's going to have a huge magnet yeah. effect. Um, but I mean, someone messaged the other day about they were I can't remember where they were. They were like burning in hardwoods. I mean, is it is it you know worth? I said, look, you're going to have a positive response you know, from fire, no matter what you do, it's just always going to be, um, I guess the, the ceiling on it is really going to depend on the canopy, the kind of some pun more sunlighting hit, hitting the ground is going to be more of a a better response. And so, um, you know, we're, we're just, we've been getting closer to that second, second thin age and a lot of our stuff. And so I'm really excited about, what this next thin and burn cycle is going yeah. to do for us. Well, there's a couple of things about that. And I, um, just to try to make it really clear to, to uh, folks out there, this, this is something that I deal with a lot, as you know. Uh, people will look at a stand, like you said, we'll see a picture of it or say, oh, you need to get more sunlight in it. Well, what if you have in 70% of your stands? we kind of get this mindset. I don't know why it just like is a human nature thing where we think everything has to be one way and we're, you know, Oh, we had to thin everything down to a low basal area and burn it. And that's just simply not true. That tends to be the limiting factor. Yeah. And we kind of, even biologists very commonly will see, you know, right. we'll see that response. But the reality is having some, closed canopy stands that you're burning under or not burning mixed in with some that are low basal area that are burning would be more ideal. Uh, 
it's just the case that most of the time the lower basal area burned frequently stands aren't don't exist so it's kind of like a shoe in but yeah. I, I like to bring that up because i see that a lot uh and hear it a lot and, and i get messaged about it a lot and i know you do uh not everything should look the same it just happens that the thing that's missing a lot is what you just described where you're you know, th- getting the some stands then, especially right now when it's hard for a lot of people to move wood, uh, you know, that, that's just limited mm-hmm. on the landscape in mm-hmm. general. So uh, I think that's a good thing for people to think of. Well, really, I, yeah, and I, I feel that one thing that, you know, learn from you is just understanding historical fire regimes. And there's probably a good chance that, you know, the landscape had varying mm-hmm. amounts of canopy enclosure based on, just different factors and how that fire behaved as it moves across the landscape. So, you know, we've our kind of MO on this next thing and is, Hey, you know, we're, we're, we've got kind of a, a baseline of where we want the basil to be, so to speak, but we're not going to mm-hmm. save an inferior tree to maintain a basil area. We want nothing but our best stand remaining. So there's going to be some spots in there that, you know, they may, they mm-hmm. may be really open and there's going to be some, would be more closed and so i think the, the response of the understory yeah. is going to be really unique to see and be a little bit closer to maybe a natural yeah. stand and what you well, see uh, that kind of variable retention of basal area within your harvested stand I, I don't see that very often but i've seen some examples of it especially when they're relatively large cuts where that can produce some really high quality mm-hmm. habitat for a suite of species not just turkeys you know, that variable retention where you have little patches that might be 100 or 120 basal area, and then you might have other places where you might have three or four acres that there isn't a tree in, you know, uh, that variable retention could be really valuable. And you you actually, uh, you may end up really enjoying the results that you see from those stands if you do that intentionally. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But well, it, it's, you know, it, it, I, I love this aspect of the whole land ownership thing. And I know a lot of your listeners are landowners, um, you know, getting to craft kind of the way that the the property is going to be shaped. Um, that's what been has been neat over the last 25 mm-hmm. plus years. Convert this from a, you know, we, we just planted another 22 acres um, actually a week or so, or a week or so ago. And so, <laughs> yeah, I wish I could press a fast forward button <laughs> and get it to where there's, you know, I'm burning up underneath it and there's goblin turkeys in the hardwoods yeah. we planted and all that stuff. But being able to kind of craft it, but I think that's something that if I would impart wisdom upon people that are kind of in the same boat that they're about to plant some old pastures and things like that is make sure that you've got your infrastructure down the road. Um, you know, your you're leaving adequate spot off of your your um, field edges and things like that for fire breaks because if you want to get in there, you know, before that plantation has been thin and you've planted right up to the fence row, you may mm. have a difficulty in establishing a fire line. It may cost you may have to push down some trees, which you don't want to do. So we we made sure that we left really large buffers. I say really large, but you know, enough mm-hmm. to establish a fire line or clover or things like that. so that in, you know, hard to believe in, you know, nine or 10 years, we could possibly be running a, a cold fire under some of that. And yeah. we want to make sure no, we got the infrastructure point. to do it. And to me, I, I'm right there with you. One of the most fun things about having a property is being able to plan out and shape what it looks like and seeing the critters respond to it, seeing your crops grow, you know, whether they're trees or whatever, uh, that there's a lot of intrinsic right. value, at least from my perspective and, and just being a part of that process, mm-hmm. you know, growing the whole landscape and shaping it yeah. so that it produces more of your, your species of interest. So there's a lot of value in that. I think we just as humans just mm-hmm. like to grow stuff. So, uh, you know, think about it that way. It's a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And, um, you know, I, I just I have a lot of satisfaction in being able to take some of these stands that haven't been burned yet, that are starting to get to that phase where they don't have a whole lot of utilization for wildlife and wild turkeys, and to be able to take that fire through there 
and basically, you know, <laughs> reset that plant community mm -hmm. uh, and see what it can benefit for turkeys and while otherwise. Yeah. I am interested in other wildlife, <laughs> by the way. I know I keep talking about turkeys, but yeah. that's a well, really I think cool a, that's one of the beautiful me, things so. about this. We have, you know, it's okay for turkeys to drive your decision making, knowing that a lot of the decisions you would make to benefit the turkey are going to benefit a whole bunch of other species too. A lot of those species aren't doing very well. So, yeah, you know, I, I take solace in that. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I talk a lot about managing for turkeys and deer and quail sometimes, depending on where I'm at. And uh, in my head, as a wildlife biologist, I'm thinking about that more holistically, that there's an umbrella of species that that will benefit from it. And namely, those species are things that we're concerned about. Uh, particularly, you know, our, our fire obligate or our early succession obligate species, you know, they're they're the ones that are going to benefit from these sorts of practices. So uh, that's something that I like to bring up occasionally. I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, you know, you're not you're making decisions based on on uh, turkeys a lot of the time, but that's not all you're affecting positively. Right. Right. Well. And you mm -hmm. know, you always hear the saying, the, the quail is the firebird. I mean, I, I, you know, if they're fire dependent, wild turkeys are fire aided, especially in this mm -hmm. southern pine dominated ecosystem that we live in. Um, you know, you look at a lot of the problems that face the wild turkey here in the deep south, and a lot of it just has to come down with usable space. And that usable space would be positively impacted if, you know, fire was implemented uh, on the landscape. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by mm -hmm. what I'm seeing from the, the private landowner, um, more people getting fire on the ground. I, I, I do uh, challenge the um, some of the larger landowners to to figure out ways to implement that strategy. I mean, turkeys, all wildlife and, and thus the, the quality of, from a recreational standpoint of the properties that they're leasing out for today's current prices, I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, can be positively impacted by fire. So um, I think we've got to, as a community, you know, whether that's through um, call share programs or whatnot, be able to help those people. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe some, um, some, I don't know, I'm not saying litigation, but uh, things that could help stiffen their mm -hmm. defense against liability. Um, that's, statutes in the state or whatnot, but I, I I really feel like if someone is properly trained and they take the proper precautions and those are documented and, and they burn on the proper mm -hmm. day that they should be fully indemnified uh, and protected from any lawsuit, whether it has credibility or is completely frivolous. Um, fire is too important to our ecosystem for people to have fear of when they've properly used it, they, they still have risk. And so whether they're, you know, whether it's a landowner burning five acres off or someone that's burning 500 acres in a block or the, the federal government burning all 5,000 in a day, uh, if it, if it's properly executed and people have the proper training and they're mm -hmm. issued a burn permit, that should be the end of their concern from, from the liability and litigation standpoint. Um, that should be something that, you know, I don't know if the if the ability to assess risk in some of these models mm -hmm. and things like that when someone plugs in coordinates is there, but that's something that could probably help these states where they're like, look, yeah. we ran a model on this and they had no risk whatsoever. Um, this is an act of God that happened that changed these conditions. Mm -hmm. They burn within the prescription that they yeah. filed with us. And well, there, there is a uh, act of God. legislation <laughs> in a lot of states that are that are uh, right to burn in nature and. Uh, there are people who right a lot smarter than me that are working on that kind of idea where uh, we're, we're trying to model these these different things and yes. there are plenty of people interested in that risk and I think you're right that that that's a that's definitely a and that's, that's one great. thing particularly for some of the large landowners but it's, so, it's still a barrier even for for uh, the non-industrial private landowner as well. The perceived risk is definitely a barrier, and I understand that. And like you said, that we should have a healthy fear of fire, right? It's just like you should if you get on a tractor. 
a tractor can hurt you or somebody else too. And, you know, you need to right. respect that, but not, not keep, let it keep you from owning one. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, it's just a different kind of, of a situation with fire, but, you know, like we said, this is a tool that, that uh, our systems need. So what, on, <clears throat> on your property, when you were talking about mm -hmm. these places, yeah. are you, uh, are you only burning in pine stands or do you have other stuff that you're doing as well? Like, a, like other, other hardwoods or, or openings or anything? Um, yes, yeah, started dabbling a little bit in hardwoods, um, you know, and, and through the years, I mean, there's mm -hmm. been places that, you know, we've allowed it to burn into an SMZ and say that, something like that, but as far as specifically taking a block of hardwoods, putting a fire break around it and, and, and lighting it, um, we started doing mm -hmm. that last year, um, small acreage spots, just trying to reduce the um, the amount of undesirables sure. in there, get that leaf litter off, and, and try to stimulate that new growth. And I was very pleased with the um, we we combined one of these stands was combined mm -hmm. with a um, um, mid story thinning, or I say a mid story um, undesirable yeah. thinning, so we left nothing but our water and red mm -hmm. oaks in there, and uh, remote sweet gum, hackberry, all that type of stuff, and so did a really nice job of opening up the canopy and um, the fire last year, I, it was just a low intensity fire it crept along. I, I did take the the time to go through there and rake around the, you know, the bowl of the tree. Um, that was probably a little overkill in some instances, but I was very pleased with how it did. I was really pleased with the vegetative response. Um, you know, I, I posted a little video on the report. Mm -hmm. I went in there kind of like towards the end of April. And um, it was perfect, perfect brew rearing habitat. So yeah, that's great. I'm looking for the right day to to do that again, that spot again, because it, you know it's already come back where you know it's waist high in vegetation now. Uh, which I wanted mm -hmm. it to remain, you know, become a nesting area. That would be perfect. But I think that's something cool about for you know about burns is that you can look at different parts of your your stands and say, well. I want this to be a brood rearing habitat. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I may burn this every year. Uh, maintain yeah. that low structure. This right here, I'm going to be fine with extending it to two, maybe three years. So it's more of a nesting area. But that's can mm -hmm. kind of be the architect in making sure you have those places in juxtaposition of one another um, that allow, you know, turkeys to be in the most critical phase of their life, have the best chance of survival. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's cool. What are, uh, any openings or well, like I've, early I've been succession? a part of those. So, boss man does a you know, toxic does a big uh opening, it's yeah. kind of a you know, one of these prairie places that, that they had low yeah. on the pines, and so it really is you know, it's going to be amazing <laughs> what it looks like in 20 to 30 years. It's going to really look like an old savannah setting, but mm -hmm. you know, I've helped them with that. But on our place, we really don't have. Many areas, I mean, there there will be some blocks that I burn that, you know, it will it will push into some broom sedge and fescue, and then once it gets a certain mm -hmm. area, it'll just it'll play out. So yeah, it'll it'll clean up some openings, and that's a great way to use fire to kind of extend that that roadside or extend that opening. Um, so, yeah. but yeah, the predominant thing we're doing is burning on uh, lava valley pine understory. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, uh, is there anything that, you know, thinking about some take-home messages as, as a private landowner that, you know, during your lifetime, you've started becoming very active with using fire. Is there anything that you want listeners that are in a similar situation to take home from our conversation? Again, I tell people to start small, start with help, shadow someone, run yeah. to these learn and burns. Um, mm hmm I'm, I'm really encouraged by all the education. Um, I was talking with um, one of my friends here that teaches uh, biology at the, the school here in, in town, and she's actually got her students, you know, they're going to come out and shadow us burning one day and, you know, just kind of, cool. of learn and burn, you know, for a few 
So yeah. These are the types of opportunities that we as a community have got to expand upon because we need people to understand. They need to, the kids in particular need to see how cool it is. Because that's going to yeah. spark them to potentially, you know, pun intended, spark them to potentially yeah. go into <laughs> forestry and wildlife biology and things like that. So Marcus right. Lashley can be out there waiting in the in the wing. But um, yeah. <laughs> come on, I hope yeah. not. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're famous. Yeah, well, that that's one thing uh, uh, that I was thinking about earlier when you were saying something else. My, I don't know if you knew my my uh, great grandparents, the Lavenders. Yes, but uh, I remember a story from one of them, and of course, I was a little bit <laughs> thing at the time. You know, I was a single digit age, but I think it was my my great grandmother was telling me how when she was my age, they didn't mow the grass. Yeah. They burned everything. Right. right. They would just go out and burn everything up. And it was just a part of their life. Yeah. That's just what they did. Yeah. And uh I always that's just kind of resonated with me. I don't think it led me into the passion uh for for fire that I have now, but uh it does still stick in my brain mm-hmm. as one of the you know, I have some memories of them, but I was pretty young when they passed away. And that's one thing that's kind of stuck in my head is, whoa, they didn't mow the grass. They burned it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that was cool, you know, just thinking about it. But it yeah. kind of speaks to what you're talking about. That was a part of their life when they were kids. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, we, we have a whole generation now where they, they probably don't. A lot of them don't know that fire was a thing. So uh, There's... Yeah, that's definitely a, another issue to address i'm glad you're taking some action to do that yeah there's a great passage in the book uh long li- long leaf far as i can see which is kind of a picture book but about a mm-hmm. guy that was kind of back in the days of the dixie crusaders and all that before herbert stoddard kind of brought back fire but mm-hmm. uh, back back then you know it was, a, it was a guy that washington county alabama that owned a lot of land i think i know whose family it is but <laughs> anyways he'd run <laughs> down and if he saw a, a thicket in some you know in some pine trees or whatever, he'd throw out a match. Just keep, it didn't matter if it was his or not. You know, he was burning yeah. his off. He said, by gosh, you need to have, you know, a, a clean pine forest for all of us. But, um, yeah, yeah, I just, back to what you were saying, the take home message for people at home. I, I think yeah. starting small, um, really learning how fire behaves under different conditions and under different times of the year. Mm-hmm. I know my, Track record this year was not great with growing season burns, but if I had my druthers, I would have half of my targeted acreage burn in September and October. Mm. Um, I really like the response that you get from it. I really like getting it done and yeah. kind of setting the table going into the to the winter months where you've got places that maybe turkeys weren't using that, that mm-hmm. I mean couldn't use in the winter. They're already burned. They're already done. You don't have to go back in there. Mm-hmm. They're they're done. Um, it's it just it is a different, as you know, it's just a different animal conditions wise. I mean, this mm-hmm. is so wet. I mean, when it's the middle of September, and you know you you reach down the 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 duff layer, and your hand comes out and it's it's just sopping wet. You know, it's really tough to get a fire to burn, especially yeah. as I experienced this year, you know, the tops of the trees would be whipping around and there'd be no ground, you know, no ground mm-hmm. when you don't have the needle cast yet. So your, your, your duff and debris is just a little thinner. So, but I've had some great burns that, gosh, I mean, it just looks great and mm-hmm. a great job and knocking back your sweet gum and yopon and stuff like that. But so that really would be the second take home was explore different, you know, windows. Um, you've done a great job of promoting alternative burn windows in just January, February, 1st of March. Yeah. If for um, no other reason, just to give you more opportunity to get your stuff done. Well, absolutely. And look, we, we've talked about this a lot. You have done a great job of talking about it. But I can remember some of the years that we just never had a burn window. I mean, mm-hmm. some of the stuff that I would have burned stayed underwater for two months. Mm-hmm. And you know, the stuff up on the hills, we never had a good burn day. Mm-hmm. So we just, there was a year that we literally missed a complete burn window. And that's hard to believe, but we, had we 
been looking for those burn windows in say September, October, November, December, not been worried about, you know, one of those deer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would have been a year that we probably wouldn't have run in that predicament. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we had a pretty weak turkey season as a result that year because a lot of those areas were just not, not used for, for wild turkey. So again, that's, that's the second take home. I guess the third would be to, I, I really like the segmenting down your sections because it does reduce some of your smoke risk where you don't mm-hmm. have 50 acre block. The drawback with that is um, you really need to figure out how to get some sort of a ATV ignition or UTV ignition sort of thing. Because I end up walking like seven or eight miles on a slow day on mm-hmm. those burns. Constantly light backfires and strips and spots and all this. It's great for my waistline. But to, to be able to burn like those good, really good burn days when you need to be lighting 100 acres because it's just such good conditions. Mm-hmm. Have just no risk like tomorrow. Um, that's the reason why we're recording today. I requested yeah. Charlotte to this up. <laughs> the dispersion here is like 115. <laughs> the interstate could be 20 yards from your fire line and you wouldn't have any risk. Yeah. Those are the days you need to have as much fire as you can. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult to do that if you and one other person are holding. Yeah. So all that to say is I think just getting your capability level where on those good burn days – you're able to to really capitalize on it, and yes, you've got it broken down into smaller sections, but you're you're you know igniting at a faster rate. Yeah, good point. Well, uh, I know that uh, that you have other things going on, and and uh, I'm sure you have other places to be and and people to to show some turkeys and whatnot. So. Uh, I really appreciate you again coming on the show and being a part of Turkey Week. I'm really excited about this. I hope uh, the listeners appreciate getting some perspective from folks like yourself that are out there really trying to get things done and and, uh, have that experience. Uh, So I I appreciate you taking that time. And I hope that uh, you have a really good turkey season if I don't get to talk to you before then. Well, the thing I'm so encouraged about, you know, my Focus has just shifted, and you, you understand this being a, a, a dad of now yeah, too. Yeah. Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. That's all. Now you're outnumbered, right? Oh, yeah. You got two girls. Yeah, okay. two girls. <laughs> two. yeah, yeah. But um, you know, your mindset starts to shift from where it's just all about hunting and mm-hmm. killing that good stuff to where it's more of a conservation mindset, and just making sure that they have the opportunities that. Um, that, that you and I grew up with, with exceptional hunting and hunting in exceptional habitat and all that and things that have changed the last few years. But I have been so encouraged in talking to people about the, the, the hatch that we had this year. Uh, I think that maybe things are starting to align, but I think that, you know, we, we've uh, met the good Lord halfway in, in how we've been working for this bird. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of the things and the places where I'm hearing this is where people are doing a lot of habitat work, um, the right type of predator control, and, and they're making a difference over a large area. And so that's why I know that the model is out mm-hmm. there, um, you know, to create the best possible situation that we can. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the rest of it's up to Mother yeah. Nature, but um, the model's out there. It's just a matter of putting those puzzle pieces together, mm-hmm. as you said. Uh, it's not being afraid to have those awkward conversations with your neighbor and trying to form a cooperative like the deer folks mm-hmm. have figured out. So it, it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of positive things. Um, I just think we've got to keep the the pedal to the gas pedal. We got a, a a bird that's really two years away from a pretty serious problem at any given point. Mm-hmm. You know, if they all wake up one day and decide that hey, we're not going to we're not going to breed for two years. That's a species that's pretty much walked itself into yeah. uh, extinction. So you never really get to plateau with your efforts towards this bird, but you got to shift your mindset to where you enjoy mm-hmm. doing it. And that's honestly, <laughs> I love hearing turkeys gobble and I love hunting turkeys, but burning is not yeah. very far. Yeah. I like hearing that crackling too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah, I that's knew you'd exactly. be a, good person to have on because you're actively using fire obviously and passionate about turkeys but i know that you enjoy it so 
that's a that was a big draw. And and the people that have gotten on board with this mindset and this almost yeah. this lifestyle, they they feel the exact same way. It's not a mm-hmm. it's not a labor, labor of love. It's it's something they yeah. enjoy doing. And um, we we saw have seen that for years on the deer hunting side of things. They they've always been a little bit ahead of us in the, the active management. Maybe fifteen twenty years ago. The landscape was such that active management wasn't quite as imperative. Today, I think it's absolutely imperative if we want to restore our turkey populations to the numbers that we grew up hunting around. Um, we hold the keys. Yeah, good points. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's always good to talk to you. Good to see you. Uh, hope you have a great season. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, We'll uh, talk to you next time. Our university is part of the Natural Resource University Podcast Network, funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.